Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. A few announcements. Hopefully you did receive an email. I've had a meeting come up on Wednesday, and which is today, and I won't be available in the normal office hour time slot today. Friday, no office hours either because of homecoming. And likewise, no class on campus on Friday. I still haven't decided if I want to give you something to study while we are gone, but if not, just kind of watch for D2L and emails relative to that. The next time we get together physically will be Monday, which is when your lab number two reports are due. Hopefully you have been successful in reserving a time slot and hopefully the labs are working properly for you. Homework number six is not due for a while. It's due a week before the next exam, but we have a seventh homework squeezed in between those. So we'll have a seventh homework due on the Wednesday before, and homework number six obviously will be dealing with root locus, which is what we're talking about today and the next few class periods probably. But we want to start today with the rules on how do we construct these diagrams, these root locus plots that appear on the complex S plane. If you're in 541, there is the project description and material available on D2L for you to study. I want to start today simply by giving us a, a place to start or to focus on the block diagram that gives rise to all of this, which is closed loop behavior, and we want to be able to discuss or learn how to manipulate or adjust K and potentially poles and zeros in our controller to steer the root locus diagram into regions that we would prefer in the complex S plane. That's the idea. We will state two conditions behind all of the rules that we will use to sketch these diagrams and the two conditions are fairly basic. It all boils down to what values of S satisfy the characteristic equation? And then we will start discussing this list of rules, which there are six, and I don't expect you to write this down. I'm not gonna probably spend that much time on this segment of the slide, but you should be starting to get comfortable with these different rules. And it's not like you can step methodically down through these. Sometimes a rule applies, sometimes it does not, and sometimes you might want to shuffle the order, but this is a fairly consistent ordering of how you might march through the process of sketching these diagrams. Obviously, the first one is where do we start and end? These branches of the root locus. Are there segments on the real line that belong to the root locus? What's the root locus do as K gets really, really big? What's its asymptotic behavior? Does the root locus come in or leave the real line, breakaway and reentry points? Does it cross the imaginary axis? Does it go back and forth between the right half plane and the left half plane, different branches? And if we have complex conjugate poles and zeros, how does the root locus approach those zeros or depart from the poles? Those are the rules for the root locus diagram. It's all based on a closed loop system configuration, and this is, let's say, what we will agree to to establish notation. We will have a forward transfer function block, which is really two blocks, a controller block and a plant block that we may just combine and call G of S. But that's now the product of G sub C and G bar, where G sub C is our controller and our plant is G bar. And 
if our controller has a gain, we're actually going to extract or pull that out or isolate that, focus on that gain K. That's what we are adjusting. That's what we have the knob for that we turn from zero all the way up to infinity and try to discover wh where these branches live or where they are on the complex S-plane. And if we have feedback dynamics, then we will have an H of S. Most of the time in this class, we are going to focus on negative feedback. Our rules will be based on negative feedback. If we switched to positive feedback, that really just changes the sign in our characteristic equation, and you'll see that that now changes one of the two conditions and so it would kind of turn on its head these rules that we are learning for negative feedback. So that's why I've tried to emphasize that you can have negative feedback or positive feedback, but in this class we are going to focus on the negative feedback, which we've been consistently doing most of the semester anyway. Based on that block diagram, then we can derive the closed loop transfer function. That's just our cheer. That's g over 1 plus gh, and we have to kind of realize what g represents. g is k g sub c g bar, and h is h. But whether we have a plus sign, g over 1 plus gh, that plus is due to the negative feedback. If, in fact, we had positive feedback, then we'd have to change our cheer, and we don't want to change our cheer. We've got it so ingrained, G over 1 plus GH. Otherwise, it would be G over 1 minus GH. What governs closed-loop behavior is a result of what that denominator does or how it behaves or what it looks like. Where are the roots? And that's what we are focused on. We're focused on the denominator of T of S and whether you have one plus or one minus KGH obviously depends on negative or positive feedback but we again are going to be focused on the plus sign. One plus KGH. And the root locus tells us how these poles move around in the complex S-plane as we adjust K. Those roots then depend on K. The roots are simply the values of S that satisfy that equation. So if you plug in an S and it doesn't satisfy 1 plus KG of S H of S equal to 0, you know that point's not on the root locus. If I ask you a thumbs up or thumbs down, multiple choice on the final, who knows what the final's going to look like, but it might be interesting. You never know what's going to happen with the final exam. But whatever it is, if you're asked that question, you know how to check it. You just say, oh, does it satisfy this? And essentially, our two rules are based on that equation, 1 plus k g of s h of s equal to 0. And that's what we're focused on. And we can do some algebra. We can subtract 1 from both sides. We start with 1 plus k g of s h of s equaling 0. We're interested in the values of s that satisfy that. Well, that's equivalent to saying we need k g of s h of s to equal minus 1. And now all we need to do, all we need to do, what we need to do is put on our electrical engineering hat and say, oh, I can look at minus 1 in a special way. I can look at minus 1 as a complex number. And if I do, how can I write minus 1 as a complex number? It has a magnitude and it has an angle. And what is the angle? Well, it could be minus 180 or plus 180, and we would still get to minus 1. In this class, we will usually just adopt 
well, we will for this class, we will just adopt the fact that we're going to go in a clockwise direction to get from the positive real axis to minus 1. So we're going to go there via minus 180 degrees. But it's equal, equivalent to saying 1 at an angle of plus 180. We're getting there the same way. But now we can see that S is a complex number, and this expression, k g of s, h of s, if we evaluate it at any value of s, it's going to produce a complex number. If that s, if that particular s, is on the root locus, then it satisfies this equation, or that value of s allows g of s, h of s, to have an angle of minus 180 degrees. And we can adjust the gain k, we're adjusting that gain k from 0 to infinity. So that now gives us flexibility to move this path or move along this path towards its ultimate end, which are the endpoints of the root locus. But here, what I want to emphasize is that here is our magnitude. and there is our phase. And this is really just a complex number. And we want to use that fact to say that, oh, now I can say that the magnitude of k g of s h of s needs to equal 1 and it has to have a phase of minus 180 degrees. Those are the two rules. If you forget all of these rules, you can always go back and say, what's my closed loop denominator? That's 1 plus k g of s h of s. Oh, I can solve that for k g of s h of s. That's equal to minus 1. Oh, that's just 1 at minus 180 degrees. These two conditions are what drive all of the rules of the root locus. So if you're scratching your head or going, oh, these rules, these rules, it's really just these two conditions. And it's one fact, it's we're looking at the denominator a polynomial, which when set equal to zero to give us our roots, gives us our characteristic equation. Or another way of saying that, all of these rules arise from 1 plus k g of s h of s. And a lot of times when we're talking about this, we will talk about open loop zeros and open loop poles. And what we do is we combine all of these factors that are in g of s and h of s. Whatever ends up in the numerator polynomial is n of s. And those roots are the zeros, open loop zeros. And all of the factors, after we combine g of s, h of s into the de denominator polynomial, that will give us d of s. And the values of s that cause that d of s to vanish are what we will call our open loop poles. And since it's homecoming, we need poles and zeros, or x's and o's. So now we have them. We now have the x's will be the roots of d of s, the values of s that cause the denominator to vanish, those are the x's, and the o's are the values of s that cause the numerator to vanish. Those are the n of, zeros of n of s. So let's now slow down and start looking at these rules, or writing them down. Rule number one. And as I said, we probably, I didn't give you enough time maybe to write those down when we started, but we now want to write it down and say, okay, what are the starting and ending points associated with these branches of our root locus? Somebody's stretching, or I don't know what's happening, but we're starting, and we, we will end in a little bit, okay, with these branches. If 
you're listening at home, you're wondering what I'm talking about, but the building is starting to screech a little bit or stretch or start. So the root locus branches begin or start when our knob is set to zero, when k is equal to zero, and where they start are on the open loop poles and those are in our notation, those are the roots of this denominator polynomial that we've identified that we've called D of S. That's why it was looking so weird. I'm not in the right magnification and I'll never get it right now probably. Okay. Who knows? Oh boy, now I'm way off screen, but root locus branches start at k equals zero on the open loop poles, and those are the roots of D of S, and sum of the branches. How many root locus branches do we have? If this root locus is a tree, how many branches are on that tree? What determines how many branches we have of this root locus diagram? It's governed by the open loop poles, the number of roots of D of S. That's the number of branches. Well, some of those branches end, and the number of branches or the sum are actually going to equal the number of finite zeros. But the branches end on the open loop zeros. And those are the roots of N of S. The other branches, if we don't have as many finite zeros as we have poles, the other branches actually approach the zeros at infinity. And that will become more clear as we go through these this these rules. But right now we have 1 plus k n of s d of s equaling 0 in our standard form. And if we, sort of the justification for this rule 1, if we now obtain a common denominator, we have d of s plus k n of s over d of s equaling 0. And here, hopefully, it's clear that if k is equal to 0, what values of s satisfy that equation? In this case, we're focused on this piece. d of s, we don't really worry about. That's in the denominator. We're looking at when is this overall expression equal to 0. Well, if k is equal to 0, the values of s that satisfy that are the zeros of d of s, which are the open loop poles. As k gets big, k n of s, that factor or that set of terms is going to dominate, swamp what's happening in d of s, and the values of s that solve that are going to be the values of s that make n of s equal to zero or the open loop zeros. That's the sort of idea behind rule number one. Let's illustrate that with an example. Suppose that I say, well, our forward transfer function, g of s, is s plus 1 over s plus 2, s plus 3. 
So you can see I was getting really creative when I was formulating this. One, two, three, I can count. H of S, here's actually where I must have taken a walk or something and changed up. Now I have seven and five as my H of S. And what the notation that we will be doing is we're going to say that our open loop zeros, those are defined as these open circles and our open loop poles are defined by X's, X's and O's. So if we are now drawing the root locus diagram, the first step that we want to do is plot on the complex S-plane the X's and O's locations. In this case, if we have our S-plane, here's the real part of S and here is the imaginary part of S, minus 1, minus 3, minus 5, and minus 7. Where do we put X's? Minus 2, minus 3, and minus 5, right? So now we have X's at minus 2, minus 3, and minus 5. And we have zeros at minus 1 and minus 7. And essentially that's all we can do with rule number 1. We know that at k equals 0 we're going to start on the x's and as we get bigger with k, as k marches off to infinity, eventually we are going to approach those two finite zeros. And the other, how many branches do we have, root locus branches, in our diagram? Do you see that red pattern? Do you see the red root locus on that S-plane? Do you see anything red there? Not yet, but where are we starting? Where did we say we start with k equal to zero? and that's going to govern how many branches we have. We start with the three poles. So we're starting on minus two, minus three, and minus five. So we have how many branches? Three. Just keep that in mind. So now let's go to rule number two. Rule number one is really kind of a benign rule. Let's now look at rule number two. It's really just rule one is focused on factoring the transfer functions. This rule number two, I could call it several different things. What I could say, it's the root loci segments on the real axis. And here I'm actually distinguishing between segments and branches. One root locus segment could have two branches associated with it. So I could call this the root loci segments on the real axis, or I could say something like the real axis segments on the root locus. And if any of you are hungry, I guess I apologize. I've used this, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think people that have heard this before, we start talking about an infinitely long something when we talk about this rule number two. Do you remember what that is? French bread. Just something to think about, and now we want to cut it into different pieces or sections. So now let's look at what we're talking about. Here I'm going to say that a line segment 
on the real axis. is a part of the root locus if and only if an odd number, odd versus even, so one, three, five, that's odd, it's not strange. Odd here is referring to odd and even, not to strange, but we have an odd number of poles and zeros that lie to the right of the line segment. And this is definitely assuming that we have negative feedback. And to see why that's true, we can simply look at the phase angle condition. Meaning, if we come back here and I say that everywhere you see a singularity, everywhere you see a finite zero or a pole, well, first off, let me go back to our French bread. Where did that come from? So now we have this loaf of French bread that's infinitely long and we've got, we have that lying on the real line. So use your imagination. You now have this French bread that's infinitely long and it's on the real axis. Now we're going to s divide that French bread or cut it everywhere we have a singularity. So we're going to cut it at minus 1. We're going to cut it at minus 2. We're going to cut it at minus 3 so that you can see that we now have segments of that bread or we now have line segments on the real axis. We have one segment from minus 1 all the way to plus infinity. We have another segment that poor individual doesn't get as much bread, but it's from minus 1 to minus 2. Another one's from minus 3, I'm sorry, minus 2 to minus 3. Another piece is from minus 3 to minus, etc. So how many line segments do we have identified with this pole zero pattern? How many line segments? Can you fit it on one hand or do you need more? Are there six? Okay, now we need to figure out of those six line segments, how many belong to the root locus? That's what we're trying to do in rule number two. We have six segments. Now we want to know where do I color those segments red? And the rule says the following. A line segment, we have six in this example, on the real axis is a part of the root locus if and only if an odd number of poles and zeros lie to the right of the line segment. So if we go back here and I'm standing at the origin, I'm on one of those line segments and I look to my right, do I see any poles and zeros to my right? No, so that segment is not on the root locus. What if I happen to be between minus one and minus two? Let's say I'm at minus one and a half and I turn right, do I see any poles and zeros? And if I do, is it an odd number? Yes, so this is actually going to be a part of the root locus. What about between minus two and minus three? I look to my right and how many poles and zeros are to my right, number-wise? I have two. Is two even or odd? You, this is tough stuff, isn't it? That's why we pulled out the French bread. 
All right, so two and three, not on it. But what about between minus three and minus five? Yes, because I have three poles and zeros to my right. What about from minus five to minus seven? Anything? No, because I have an even number of poles and zeros to the right. And what about minus seven to minus infinity? Yes, so everything to the left of minus 7 is on the root locus, every point. Is that clear from this rule? What if I had the following pattern of poles and zeros? Let's say that I had a pole here, a zero here, a pole here, a pole there, a zero here, it has to have its conjugate there, and let's say I have a pole here and a pole here. Oh my goodness. This rule, rule number two, because our poles and zeros occur in conjugate pairs, it really doesn't matter if we have complex. We just focus on what's on the real line to determine our even or odd. Since they're in conjugate pairs, if we slide to the left or right, of a conjugate pair, that's not changing the odd or even nature. So forget the, uh, the off axis poles and zeros in this rule. It doesn't matter. What segments, uh, so how many line segments do we have active in this pattern? How many real line segments are identified in this particular pattern? That one will fit on one hand, right? There's five. Now, how many of these segments belong to the root locus? Or which ones? What about from the origin to plus infinity? Is that on the root locus? No. This one is. And that one is. Those are the segments that would live on the root locus. Questions on that rule? Now we can keep going. We can look at the third rule. We can say we need to know more than that in order to finish this root locus diagram in these different cases. And this rule deals with the asymptotic behavior of the root locus. And that's going to happen when we increase k to big and big values, big or bigger values. And in this particular discussion, I'm going to say p represents the number of open loop poles, and z represents the number of finite zeros. Is it clear what I'm meaning by finite zeros? If I go back here, how many finite zeros do I have in this G of S, H of S system? Two. How many infinite zeros or how many zeros at infinity do I have? Have you ever heard of that phrase? How many, fi how many poles do we have in this configuration, G and H? Three. We have three poles. We have two finite zeros. What's the difference? P minus Z. That's how many zeros we have at infinity. We have one zero at infinity. So our pole zero excess, I'll say that a lot, P minus Z, that's one. That's how many zeros we have at infinity. So one of our branches in this particular problem is going to go off to minus infinity and now minus infinity could be at minus infinity it could be plus and minus j infinity in a sense it's just going off in some direction and leaving what our paper shows us which are finite regions of the complex s plane so when i talk of finite zeros 
it's those finite values of s that cause the numerator n of s to vanish. That's what I'm meaning by finite zeros. And we have asymptotic behavior for large k when p is not equal to z. And what we're trying to do is, here's sort of the caveat with rule number three. Rule number three is r not really giving us root locus branches, it's giving us asymptote, asymptote lines to approach with our branches. So these are just guidelines that we're establishing in rule number three. Sometimes the root locus actually lies right on these asymptotes. But here we are finding asymptotic lines that help in the sketching of the root locus. And here's a description of those asymptotic lines. The root locus is asymptotic And these are straight lines to straight lines with angles given by the following formula. The asymptote angles, which I will call phi sub a, are 2L plus 1 times 180 degrees, all divided by P minus Z, where L goes from 0, 1, 2, up to P minus C minus 1. And remember, this is what I was calling our pole 0 excess. So now this gives us the angle that these asymptotes make, and we will actually locate these straight lines at a point on the real axis. So that if we are going off at 60 to plus 60, minus 60, 180, we need to figure out where is the center of those straight lines leaving the real line, or where is it located, and that's what we're calling the centroid. These straight lines intersect, let me say at a point, which we will label sigma sub a, called the centroid, that's the centroid of those asymptotes, the centroid on the real axis given by the following formula. The centroid sigma sub a is going to be the sum of all of our poles of g of s, h of s, minus the sum of all of our zeros, finite zeros of g of s, h of s. And then we'll divide by, I think you can guess, P minus Z, the pole zero excess. So let's see if we can apply this rule, rule number three, to an example. And we've had one example, I think, up to this point. So here's example one. And that had a G of S, H of S, equaling s plus 1, s plus 7 over s plus 2, s plus 3, s plus 5. 
and we can put down our X's and O's. And maybe you can do a better job of putting them down on the paper than I can. And just as a reminder or as a review, where are the real line segments that belong to the root locus? An odd, we basically walk along the real line and we start looking to our right and counting if we have odd numbers of poles and zeros to our right. We have that segment, we have that segment, and we have that segment that belong to the root locus. And now what do we want to do? Now we want to know what's happening asymptotically in this root locus diagram. So to do that, we're going to calculate then the angle of these asymptotes. And here we have 2L plus 1 times 180 degrees all over, what's P minus Z? That's just 1, and what is L advancing to? It's going from 0 to 1 to 2 up to P minus Z minus 1. Whoops. So we don't even have to worry about all of these pieces. We have it with L equal to 0, or we now have phi sub A equaling 1 times 180 divided by 1, or our asymptote angle is 180 degrees. And it doesn't matter what our centroid is. Our asymptote is going off at 180 degrees. It doesn't matter where we locate that. We just know that eventually our root locus is going to be going off at 180 degrees. So it doesn't matter. Sigma sub A is not necessary. We start on the poles, so now this guy's going to the right, this guy's going to the left, this pole is going to that finite zero. Another branch is going there, but another branch is going off to minus infinity. And what we will learn next time, I'll give you another example before we go to next time maybe, but we will break away if those two branches between minus 3 and minus 5, they're on one line segment, they can't live there. They have to break away from the real line. We're, we will have a breakaway point between minus 3 and minus 5, and we'll figure out where that is exactly next time. But here, let's just say, oh, it's somewhere between here. Let's just break off. And then what happens? How many branches of the root locus do we have? Three. One of those branches is stuck between minus 2 and minus 1. It's just traveling there from minus 2 to minus 1. The other two are starting at minus 3 and minus 5. They come together and meet somewhere at a relative maximum of k, and then they break apart. And then what happens? Well, one will eventually end up going to minus 7, and the other one will go off to minus infinity. So whatever happens, and it's going to be nice, they don't just do this and then come back. Whatever happens is symmetric, so it's not going to be that. Luckily, I didn't lift my pin. It's going to be a nice smooth curve over here. It may not be a circle in this case because we don't have two poles to the right of one zero, but now one of those is going to go up, one's going to go down, they are going to re-enter somewhere to the left of minus 7. One's going to zip to minus 7 as we crank up the knob K, and the other one's going to go off to minus infinity. And this is what our closed-loop poles, where they live for this set of poles and zeros, open-loop poles and open-loop zeros. This will all become a little bit more clear as we develop more rules, but that's the picture. And what we were able to find in rule number three is that piece, that we were going off to minus infinity 
at an angle of 180 degrees. Let's look at another example. Suppose we have g of s equaling s plus 1 over s plus 4, s plus 6, s plus 10. Hopefully I did enough tick marks. Now the first step is putting X's and O's on the S plane. This is the complex S plane. Where do I have X's and O's? Do I have any finite zeros? I have 1 and it's at at minus 1, so I have a 0 right there. How many infinite zeros do I have? Now you can go home and imp impress your friends and neighbors. <laughs> we were talking about zeros at infinity <laughs> today. And they'll be going, what? To infinity and beyond, right? That's what we were doing today. But now we have how many zeros at infinity? Two. So we would expect two branches of the root locus to be going off to infinity. And where is infinity? We'll figure that out by the asymptote angles. But where do we have poles? We have a pole here, we have a pole here, and we have a pole there. Now we can pull out the cutting board with our French bread and figure out which of these line segments belong to the root locus. From minus 1 to plus infinity, no. From minus 1 to minus 4, yes. From minus 4 to minus 6, minus 6 to minus 10, yes. Is that clear? And this one is leaving here, this one's leaving there, and that one's leaving there and eventually we're going to approach the zero at minus one. What's our pole zero excess? We've already probably said that, haven't we? We already said how many zeros we had at infinity. So that now what is our phi sub a formula going to tell us? Well this is now 2L plus 1 times, whoa, times 180 degrees over P minus Z, which is 2, and L goes from 0 up to P minus Z minus 1, or up to 1. So we look at different values of L, L equal to 0. If L is equal to 0, what's phi sub A? 180 divided by 2, so it's 90 degrees, and L equal to 1, we have 180 divided by 2, 90, that's our fundamental angle, and now we multiply 90 by 3, or we have 270 degrees. So now we have asymptotes at 90 and 270. Where is this where are these two angles centered? Where's their centroid? Centroid is we sum up all of the poles. We have a pole at minus 4, minus 6, and minus 10. So we now have minus 4, minus 6, minus 10, minus our 0 divided by our buddy, pole 0 excess, which is 2. So now help me with the math. I have minus 20 plus 1, or minus 19, divided by 2. So not quite minus 10, right? So my centroid of my asymptote is at minus 9 and a half. Isn't that what this is? 
now I have a centroid right here and one asymptote goes off at 90 degrees, the other one goes off at two, all of these angles are measured relative to a positive real line segment. Here's 90 degrees and here's 270 degrees or you might hear me say minus 90, it's the same. But now what do we know? Now we know that we'll figure out next time where these two poles or branches from minus 6 and minus 10 break away, but eventually they're going to approach this asymptote that's centered at minus 9 and a half and at an angle of plus and minus 90 degrees because we had a pole zero excess of 2. And so those branches are going off to infinity, one's going to the north pole, one's going to the south pole, and the other branch is just migrating to minus 1. But that's the root locus for that particular configuration of poles and zeros. We'll pick up at that point next time.